This is always a great and popular session for our families and for our alumni of Bentley. Uh, we have two uh, panelists here with us today. Um, one who has been here a few years, you may look familiar to you. It's our Vice President for Student Affairs and Dean of Students, Andrew Shepherdson who arrived at Bentley in 1993. Um, so uh, long before many of your children were actually even a twinkle in your eye. But he's been here a, a long, long time and certainly our alumni know him well. Um, and also joining us today is our new president, uh, LeBrent Craig. Uh, we are delighted to have Dr. Craig here with us. He joined us in uh, June of this year when the campus was very, very quiet. Um, he comes to us most recently as president of Bethune-Cookman uh, University down in Florida. Before that, he was the dean of the Daniel School of Business at uh, the University of Denver. So um, as a member of his management team uh, working with Andrew, we, it's been a great summer of welcoming him here to Bentley. And I know he looks forward to um, speaking with you all this morning. So our format is um, Andrew and Brent are going to do a kind of a Q&A session between them. I know there are cards around the room. If there are some questions that you'd like to um, add to the list for today, we hope we've been comprehensive in trying to anticipate with, with, with what is on your mind. But if we've missed something, please don't hesitate to kind of wave to Bridget over there in the corner and she'll come and bring a card to you and hopefully we'll be able to answer that. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Andrew and Brent. Great, thank you, Maureen. Thank you for reminding me that our students are born after I arrived at Bentley, uh, but it obviously is a great place. I, I love this institution uh, and I, I love working with the students here. Before we get started, just to get a sense of who's in the audience and just um, where we are, how many are alumni of Bentley University? And how many of those alumni are parents of current students? Quite a few, that's awesome, great, welcome. How many here are parents of first year students? And parents of second year students? Third year students? Fourth year students? A few in the back, that's great. How many drove to campus today or to this event? How many flew in from elsewhere around the country or around the world? We got at least one, awesome, welcome. Thanks for coming. So, you know, and what I'd like to do is, is start out, you know, asking you a question that I think probably is on everyone's mind. You know, you're an educator, professor, you've been a dean of a business school, You've been a president, you are a president, but you're also a dad of a college student who's graduated, college students who have graduated. What's your advice as a parent uh, and a president and a dean and a professor, uh, particularly maybe for first and sophomore years, since that's the, the biggest group that's here, but what advice do you have as a parent? Yeah, thanks for that, Andrew. And first of all, a good morning, welcome. It is just a delight uh, to see you all. And uh, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Here, so yeah, we, we, have, uh, we have three kids. Uh, our youngest just finished up um, in business school. Um, there will be no surprise there at the University of Denver, uh, the Daniels College. And, um, you know, we reflect on the first couple of kids that we dropped off, you know, my wife wouldn't even attend and because she was just traumatized. And, you know, I had to do the whole drop off an inauguration. And I, and I was thinking about the sort of process from the first to the third. Uh, and the third, you know, we, we kissed her on the cheek and sent her off and said, you know, have a nice, <laughs> have a nice fight. But, but really, you know, there's, there's, that's only slightly in jest. It's actually pretty, pretty true because you, you recognize that one, you know, this is, this is the sort of natural order of things. Um, Secondarily, for me at this stage of my life and having the privilege to have been in education for so many decades, um, this is nothing less than a transformational period for your students to help identify their passion and purpose and what it means to be citizens. So of course there's angst and anxiety about grades and internships. And, and that is, like, those are table stakes, right? That is just, that is what we do. It's part of the DNA of this place. What I would ask parents and students is to, to look, look deeper 
for the enrichment opportunities that come from an extraordinary, vibrant place like this, um, and, to, and to really step out of their comfort zone so they can be exposed to the factors and conditions that will challenge and engage them for the rest of their lives. Because um, this is a safe place to do that and to experiment and to fail and to learn. And, and so those are, those are some higher aims that I hope, uh, hope the parents and the students can reflect on. That's great advice. So a little bit about you know, your arrival at Bentley, what, what drew you to this institution and, and maybe has it lived up so far to what, what drew you here? Well, well first, uh, it, it's exceeded every expectation that I've had. It has been an, an amazing four months. Um, but, you know, what, what drew me, so I'm a, I'm a business school guy, a um, couple of deanships, um, my first, first 20 years at very large, uh, University of Michigan, business school, University of Arizona. Um, so I, I am a, I'm a, I'm a business school person. And to identify a business school, to see a business school that has this intentional mandate of operating at this intersection of business and liberal arts uh, with a model of our students need to be a force. Uh, this is something that wasn't, wasn't academic to me. I mean, this is, as you and some of my colleagues know, so my area is international business and I, I work in really opaque, poor uh, markets around the world from Afghanistan to Ethiopia to Namibia to Central African Republic to other parts of Central Asia, Uzbekistan, trying to harness what we do, the power of the private sector to alleviate poverty and to provide opportunities for millions of people around the world. So, so, so my belief in the power of business is, is really quite sacrosanct. And this is an institution that is committed to demonstratively enabling our students through this rigorous education to not only uh, succeed and to be immediate value creators, um, but to recognize that with such a privilege comes a higher responsibility. And, and for me, at this stage, um, there is nothing more appealing. So that's why I'm here. You talked about the intersection of business and the liberal arts. And oftentimes I hear students say, I've just got to get these liberal arts courses out of the way. Sometimes I hear parents talking about like, I just want my kid to get rid of the liberal arts and focus on the business. Um, and as a liberal arts grad, that you know, always uh, gets me a little you know, tense, but can you talk a little bit about, I mean, yeah. obviously everybody knows, I mean, business is our, you know, our foundation sure. and uh, what students learn about business, but what's the role of liberal arts and why should students not just get rid of them? Right. So I'm really glad you brought that up and particularly for, for students, I, I hope that, that we can assist them and, um, and evolving from the notion that this is just a requirement that I have to take on my way to my accounting degree. So I went to one of the great land grant institutions in the country, uh, Michigan State University. I'm from Detroit, did my undergrad at Michigan State. And I, I was a liberal arts major. I was in this really interesting interdisciplinary program in the College of Social Science, um, being exposed to authors and a way of thinking that was completely um, antithetical to anything that I'd experienced in my inner city Detroit high school. Um, and, then I, and then I went on and got a public health degree and, uh, and then late, later in life got into the, the business school thing. And, and what has served me well, I think, is this appreciation for, for the power of that intersection. And even though um, throughout my academic career, after my corporate career, um, I was in business schools. I mean, I, I intentionally sought out appointments and opportunities at the intersection of the disciplines in liberal arts institutions because that's where the, the magic takes place. So let me let me just let me just explain one. Here's one data point for students. 
and parents. When we talk to employers, and I talk to them all the time, like all over the country, all over the world. This is, you know, I was the dean twice and second presidency. So I'm always trying to understand what, is, what are employers looking for? And of course, what's important to them are the technical and quantitative fluencies that we are so exceptionally good at. But our students come in, especially if students come here, our students come in already as digital natives and sophisticated, and they know the way around the keyboard. And not only can they extract data, but many of them can write the code to necessarily to analyze it. And so of course you need technical fluencies. And there's nobody better at that. And our employers know that that's what they're gonna get. And so when you ask our employers, including here, what they're looking for, it's never about, well, they need stronger technical capabilities. They have to be more capable of calculating the cost of capital or understanding a net PV analysis, which our students can do in their sleep. Here is what they say. We really need students who understand data we really need students who have the capacity to discern, to think critically, to reflect deeply. We really need students who can communicate effectively, both in writing and orally. We need students who are comfortable off the cuff, who can take complex information and distill it. We need students who can work in cross-cultural teams, we need students who have a sense of themselves in this increasingly global, complex marketplace defined by ambiguity and uncertainty. That is what, and if you think about it from a discipline standpoint, those are all primarily, those are liberal arts things, right? So at our best, we prepare students for jobs and for markets that do not yet exist. And there is nothing that students from Bentley University can't do. And I hope that you will take advantage of history course and a philosophy course. You may not appreciate it now, but I promise you later in life, you will understand the impact of the arts and science. Great. Thank you for that defense. It's probably more it's than you want. Arts but, uh, no, you know, that uh, is great. Um, <laughs> You talked about your educational journey. You talked about that as well in your convocation address. It, maybe, you know, as you traveled from, you know, Detroit to Michigan, you know, in Michigan, but to from high school to college, what was the role of mentors in, and uh, finding that help? And what advice to the students in the room or the parents to, help, you know, how do you find those mentors and how do you uh, activate them? Yeah, that's, a really, that's a really good point. Um, like I, again, I came out of Detroit you know, and God bless my mother who did everything she could to raise um, the four of us. Um, and, and this notion of mentorship for me wasn't, I mean, I didn't know anything about that and would have never, I mean, I just, just I didn't know what I didn't know. Um, so for me, it started with a high school teacher who saw something and, um, begin to instill a level of confidence and ability, and I'm not sure why he took an interest in me. I mean, like I had, my siblings were, we had drug addiction and violence. This was Detroit in the 70s. And, um, and so, you know, I just, I assumed there was something better for me, but I didn't quite know what that was or how to look at that. And so it was a high school teacher that finally saw something, and that's how I ended up getting to Michigan State, and then there were a couple of professors at Michigan State who, again, saw something uh, in me, um, got to graduate school, and, um, and then after the first job, a couple of folks took interest. Um, but this notion that any of us, Andrew, sort of gets here on their own is just, it's just untrue. And, um, and, and so part of my job, part of our job, part of um, the job of your kids who are here is to, you know, as we, you know, as we rise, 
to, to lift, to provide opportunities for, for others. Um, as a first generation person from where I came from, the ability to navigate this space that is likely so very comfortable for many of you is not natural for lots of folks here. And so part of the joy of being here um, is, to, uh, is, to, is to find and create those opportunities in the academic environment, uh, in the workplace, socially, and otherwise. It's a vital part of, of creating what I refer to as, as an enabling environment um, for, for young people to, to rise. Great. Let's talk a little bit about students. You've, you've been out on the campus everywhere meeting staff and faculty. Um, you know, you've met some students. We had a few students around, uh, mostly in the fitness center when you were down there. Um, but you've been out and about. You um, had an ice cream social for the first year students. You went to the activity fair. You were at the football game, uh, women's soccer, field hockey. You've been around. What have you learned about our students? What? Yeah, I, well, first of all, um, they're, they're awesome. Um, and it is a absolute privilege to steward uh, the institution that, that uh, has your students and is the co-creator of their, of their experience. Um, so I think what has, what has impressed me in this very short time um, is that I don't, I'm be careful with this. I've not seen a group of students that is so focused on outcomes, on the measures of success that we all know, whether it's grades or internships, they are resolutely committed. They are um, in the vernacular skewed toward type A personalities, if I said, is that reasonable? That's very reasonable. And so I'm, I'm looking at them and I'm just like, wow, I couldn't have competed with these kids back in the day. Um, but I can promise you, most of us say that um, here. Uh, and, um, and I find that obviously inspiring. Um, and I, I hope, I hope that they will be able to to take that commitment and passion to, to the grades and to the internships and go back to the first point I made about stepping back and recognizing um, some, of the, some of the higher dimension opportunities. This is additive, right? You don't have to, you know, it's not a zero sum. You don't lose focus on academics because you look at sort of experiential or global or social good. Um, but what, what a blessing it is to have students that come with this kind of, of, of dedication and commitment. Um, it's, a, it's a rare gift <laughs> and, and something that I am conscious of and appreciative of. And um, it's one of the things that I think makes this place so special. And one of the things that comes along with that type A personality is that drive towards success. And when failure happens, it's tough. But we've talked about that. But how important is failure, so especially I mean, in college? Yes, yeah, so I did mention that. I, I think you I hope I said something like that, you know, in an earlier address, because it's true. I mean, I don't. So I haven't been around to see these students fail, but I know students, and they're and they're going to fail. Uh, they're going to fail here. They're going to fail in their first second job. They're not going to get the promotion they want. They're not going to do as well. And and so and so, what I want to say is like, like how are you going to handle that? I mean, we all fail. And my view is that if we haven't, with consistency, then we're not, we're not doing something right. So the key is to learn how to manage failure, <laughs> to grow from it, to be better from it, and to accept it as, again, a natural part of the of the journey, and and I don't have any doubt that our kids will get there. I, I just would like to begin preparing them before they get in the job market, where it's a little exactly. maybe less forgiving. <laughs> Going back to the, your convocation address, you talked about um, Bentley operating uh, at the intersection of intellectual rigor and market relevance, uh, and I heard you at a, at another speech where you were speaking to our student leaders, our RAs, our orientation leaders, our mosaic ambassadors that were on campus. 
you talked about the role the private sector played in equity and inclusion uh, and the importance of that. Um, how does that all come together, that market relevance, that private sector, when it comes to issues of inclusion? And how should our students be preparing themselves now uh, to make this place inclusive, but also to be prepared for the private sector when they graduate? Yeah, I thought we were sticking with light questions. <laughs> um, so so, so that's, a, that's a really important question. And, and look, you know, we, we, can't, we can't escape um, the conversation this country has been reconciling itself with over the last 19 months. And, and this wasn't when commitments toward inclusivity and diversity started. There were discussions on equity and stuff before George Floyd. Um, but, but there has been um, a, a sort of renaissance in terms of the willingness to have very difficult conversations, right? And wherever you sit, whatever, I don't really care what your political proclivities are or where you're from. And what I, what I am saying is that we are in an environment now where our ability to, as I said, to effectively and deftly navigate that space is important. Whether or not you think it ought to be, it is important. I'm 60 years old. I've been at primarily from the city of Detroit and primarily at white institutions. My boards, I sit on corporate boards, they're all white. It's mine. I just came from running an iconic HBCU on the other end of the spectrum. So I've been all over the world. I've been around. And it is still something that I, I struggle with. Like it is a journey. And as long as we accept it as such, and I think we're okay. What business has done in my view, what the private sector has done is unequivocally and unconditionally say to that, we recognize this is important. We don't know how to fix it. We don't have the answers, but we are manifestly committed to it. And so for those of us who say, well, God, I don't want to talk about this stuff. And whatever. One, I suggest that there is a moral case for inclusivity and diversity and equity, but maybe disagree. But there is certainly an economic case because we know that if there wasn't an economic case, this sustained, clear commitment from the private sector would not be. And so our job is to, again, have the tough conversations, prepare, um, uh, to prepare, prepare our students and to have them recognize that um, it isn't sort of, you know, um, socialist dribble to talk about like what kind of culture are we creating here? And, um, and look, that's just hard for all of us, but we are committed to doing it. And, um, and I applaud this institution for it. There have been some very difficult conversations with sexism at Bentley, racism at Bentley. And all we can ask is that an institution possess the will and the courage to put it on the table. And that's where we are. And the private sector, in my view, is leading the way. And this is a university focused on business. And so we have no excuse not to embrace the discussion, even though it's really hard. <laughs> Let's go to some easier questions. Thank you for that. <laughs> Careful. Um, let's, the COVID response. I know that's top of mind for everybody. It's been here. You've uh, been working in it for 18 months, like all of us, but arrived here. A little bit about how you think we're doing, what our next steps are, you know, where you see us going. Right. So, um... You know, certainly the bulk of my previous presidency was the onset of COVID and navigating that and managing that with a very different population and a profoundly divergent resource base. Um, and so I just need, particularly for our first year and even second year, students and parents, I, I have been in awe of 
of the capacity that this university has displayed in terms of effectively um, migrating through the space and keeping our community safe. This is not to suggest that there isn't a right parent, particularly for second year students who have been frustrated at the loss of in-person turning. Uh, my son was a senior, didn't, didn't see class for a whole year. Um, so I understand. But if you look at the data, and if you look at our response to those data, um, so there are a lot of things here, even in a short period, that keep me up at night. Our response to COVID is not among them. COVID keeps me up, but our response is, I think, um, representing a really high standard, represents uh, an unambiguous commitment to safety, and, um, and the fact that we're here now, and I, I think two days ago we had, uh, we test up to a couple times a week. God, how many did we test last? I think we tested 800 Wednesday. On Thursday, 800 on Thursday. 800 on Thursday. And I think we had, a, we had eight positives out of 800 students. Um, that doesn't happen by accident. Now, would we rather have zero? Of course we would. But, you know, I'm looking like you are in the institutions on the street with, you know, 100 plus students. And I'm looking at many that aren't even testing because if you don't test, <laughs> you know, but, but that's, you know, that's not our way. So it's been tough. I know your students have suffered. Our faculty and staff have suffered. Um, we, we're still managing the sort of migration and in person and trying to trying to make sure that we can maintain the sort of energy of a residential place based institution. Um, but I feel I feel really really good, and I'm so proud of this team and um, our facilities folks. And we'll just continue to try to do the right thing under under pretty difficult circumstances. Let's shift to every college president's favorite topic, which is food on campus. <laughs> um, so you and I had a, an opportunity. We had lunch uh, on Thursday at the 921. How was your lunch? What did you have? <laughs> What'd you think? I, well, I, I've just concluded that I just don't have nearly as discerning a palate as your students do, because um, I thought it was, look. <laughs> Just gonna stop there. <laughs> so, so we had a we had a conversation. We had a wonderful um, event. We we're celebrating the creation of the Pulsar Center and the Cursor Center, which is just like the best in the country, by the way. Um, and we were having this conversation. And, and for me, there are two things that are just they they transcend institution and parking and food. And so, you know, I'm kind of I'm kind of used to it. Um, but I, I do want to say, do they have a chance to, have they seen it? Will they be able to- If they haven't, they can. They can you, come at any time. And throughout the semester, they you, walk into the door yes. and they say, I'm a parent and they're welcomed in. Right, you, you need to go. Um, because as university food goes, I'm just thinking it's pretty good. I mean, there's a wide variety of choice. Um, they're, they're for, there's a sort of allergenic space. There's, for salad, there's vegan, there's, I mean, there's a lot. And that's just in the, in the central sort of area. We've got other places on campus. So I'm not gonna sit up here and say, oh, it's the greatest meal you'll ever have, because that just would not be true. Um, but, you know, Andrew, um, I am pretty impressed with what I saw. And I've spent a lot of time talking to my colleagues at Sodexo, and I know how, how hard they have tried. And let me also say, in, in all seriousness, I know that there was some serious blowback last year, last couple of years before I, before I got here. I mean, I still see the sort of, you know, social media posts. <laughs> I mean, it was serious and, and legitimately so. And they have responded in a way that is, for me, both evident uh, and inspiring. And, and so what we have now is the, is the two. And so, I, and so seriously, I, I would ask you to just, just spend some time, come and, come and dine with your child, 
call me up if you're on campus. I'll come have lunch with you. Uh, and uh, we, we, we did not tell them we were coming, we did not. right? Because nope. uh, that wouldn't work. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's all. And, and I do think, and, and you know, we hear from students a lot, yeah. you know, and uh, returning students, and I have heard, uh, you know, students are not afraid to tell me that they're not happy with the dining plan. And so even from, you know, our pre-arrival athletes, um, the, the message was being really clear that, um, you know, it's better. Uh, there's been a big improvement from what we were experiencing a couple of years ago. I do think sometimes students are overwhelmed by choice, right? And so it's hard, I mean, you go in there, there's a lot of choice. Um, how do you figure out, you know, and the Sodexo team is there and, uh, you know, I've seen them actually walk a student around like, well, what do you like? Well, so let me point you in the right direction. So, um, and I'll also say, and I'll point out, because he's sitting right in front of my eyesight is Rich Rubini, who is uh, the manager of the dining program on campus. And we were remarking, uh, we were walking up the hill um, and I think almost as many students knew his name um, as knew my name. And I think that's a testament to how much they're really working with students to, to get them, uh, you know, what they need, how they need it, uh, the times that they need it, the variety that they need. So I, I'm sure he's willing to answer questions uh, afterwards or, or at any time, but I really do think things are better. Um, and I do encourage you. I mean, you can just walk up, say you're a parent, uh, and they'll be happy to um, help you out. And at any time, a student has a concern, and there's always going to be, you know, you're, they're feeding thousands of students a day in that dining hall, there's always likely to be an issue. There's a manager there at all times. There's staff there that will, you know, immediately, you know, during the day at lunchtime, Camille is there checking people in. You got to meet our campus celebrity, Camille, who checks students in, really willing to answer those questions. So uh, hopefully we've gotten that uh, cleared up. And so if there are other questions, they can bring those forward, but, um, you know, I'll come up with some off the top of my head. So, you know, let's talk a little bit about um, athletics. So you've been to a few sporting events. What's what's the role of athletics on a college campus? And yeah. uh, I know you've met with our commissioner. You've uh, spent some time with our athletic director. What do you you know? How are we doing? And what do you think that role is? Yeah. So I, it's been a it's been a thrill to to see our, our um, student athletes uh, in action, and it's it's also wonderful to actually talk about student athletes and have it be the truth. Um, and I like Division One. Athletics, just like everybody else, and again, spent 20 years of my career at Division One places. Um, but I am really pleased to be at a place that emphasizes sort of the quality and the, the competitiveness of, of athletic activities, while consistently um, focusing on the development of young men and women uh, and their success in the classroom and in the marketplace. And so for me, it's the best of both worlds, right? And I'm looking forward to the football game today. Uh, and um, and to, if, if there's, a, there's an on-campus uh, event uh, and I'm here and can get over there, I, I get over there because I just enjoy, I, I enjoy sports and I enjoy supporting our kids. Um, and it's a, it's a big, uh, big part of this community. And we have a wonderful new, um, not as new as I am, but new athletic director in Vaughn Williams was bringing a whole new level of energy and um, commitment. And so I think that there's just some, some great things ahead. The new energy is, you know, I mean, he's an one of the most <laughs> energetic, uh, you know, I, I meet with him quite a bit and he's in my leadership team and he's, you know, uh, let's go, let's go. So he's really exciting. Um, I'm gonna ask you a bit of a shameless plug uh, for the co-curricular experience hmm. that out of the classroom, you know, we talked about the Bentley Plus program. I know there is a session that was either has, is about to happen or has happened today, hmm. but why, you know, it's a place-based institution. Why should students take advantage of the things outside the classroom? Yeah, because um, our, our job, again, at our, at our best is to provide a deep, uh, inspiring and immersive education. And much of the immersion needs to take place out of the classroom. There's a sort of evolving um, sort of philosophy, a framework, if you will, of pedagogy that suggests that with, with um, increasingly ubiquitous distributed platforms and ways of communicating and sharing the body of knowledge, we can use you know, online experiences to transfer knowledge, we can use the classroom to sort of provide context, but we use 
the marketplace to to ensure that there's the lived experience. And it's the lived experience that really provides our students one, a comparative advantage when they're interviewing, uh, a personal narrative, a story, provides some context, uh, and also enables them to engage um, with clients if they're doing consulting projects, um, engage as team members. And um, this is just a powerful way for students to, uh, to, to learn and being a university at our intersection, we're uniquely poised to, to do that. So Bentley Plus, the Service Learning Center are just wonderful possibilities. And, and I hope, particular for our, our younger students, I, I just, I really hope you'll take advantage of that because that in the end of the day is, is gonna be some of the most memorable of your experiences. Can you share a little bit about, you know, what you're thinking about going forward? What are the things you wanna be working on? You want the university to be working on? What are some of the vision that you have that you think, you know, Bentley needs to address and, and to keep moving forward and to remain successful? Yeah, so we've been focused, uh, again, I haven't been here long, but, but for almost all that time, we've been focused on, on, on really an essential question that's really easy to ask, but, but hard, to, hard to execute. And it, it's something along the lines of, you know, how do we provide the necessary sort of fealty and, and regard for a, for a wonderful and rich tradition and history? while ensuring that the institution has the capacity to pivot in a way that's necessary for profoundly disrupted 21st century. Again, like easy to have a conversation about, like, what does that mean? And, and for us in part, it is, uh, as my colleagues know, figuring out together as a community, faculty, staff, students, trustees, what does the next tier of excellence at Bentley University look like? And I say doing it together because it, it has to be a narrative around which this whole community, you, your students, our internal stakeholders can coalesce around. And then once we define what that looks like and we have some ideas, then we begin to go about building the scaffolding uh, over the next three to five, seven years um, to get there. We are in a really competitive higher education marketplace, as you know. Um, there are all kinds of new and disruptive entrants into this market space. I'm new to the Northeast and I'm, I'm just, I'm struggling with like all these universities here. I mean, I'm used to being in Denver with like four um, uh, in a place larger than the whole Northeast. <laughs> I mean, wow, there's a lot of choices. How do we, how do we continue to ensure an unambiguous and compelling value proposition in the midst of all of these amazing places? The upside is that we are uniquely positioned in ways that you know, others can't be. Um, and so our job is to sort of harness that in a way that, that lets us define what the next step is. So I guess a lot of work for this place, um, but, but um, they're up to it. And we are going to start that process like immediately as in this month. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm excited about it, but, but um, our, our job is to be better, to be more competitive um, and um, continue to attract these amazing students and offer innovative boundary spanning programs. And um, that's what we're committed to doing. I think you've answered uh, this question, but I, I think it's a good one. I think it's you know a good one to to repeat, and it's it's about how much will you, as the new president and the administration, be involved in getting to know students? Uh, you know, during COVID, it's been hard uh, the personal interactions. Um, you know, and and so you know you've mentioned that, but you know I think it's worth. I mean, students already know who you are. I mean, it, it's been pretty clear, but. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's a, it's a really important question. And I, I will acknowledge that I guess different presidents have um, different styles and 
a mine it's just is just um being accessible i mean i i'm in this field i go as a student and i want to get to know students um and um so making myself accessible uh is a part of it so getting out um intentionally and consciously to their events making sure they know that my door and i've said this before and it's true my door is always open like figuratively and literally it's it's always open for students for anything um and so but look it's the same for me and the faculty i got to get to know them as well um and and i still got got to get some work done um and so i, I need to try to sort of balance that and um but but central to any progress we make is going to be connecting um in a way that's that's real and i hope real reciprocal with students and it's just the best it's the best part of a job like this and um, so i will continue to do all i can toward that end and sometimes i think people don't always know that you live here um your house is here um and i, I think many students and i hear this a lot like was that the president running this morning or uh running up from the fitness center at the fitness center so you are you are very uh very visible um you touched on this in the previous question, but maybe a little bit more specifically about, you know, some specific changes, you know, academically, facilities, you know, we do have some big academic changes coming up for future uh, right. Falcons. Yeah, so there's some there's some core curricular changes that um, that we're looking at. There are a couple of things that are important to me. Um, so again, my job in part is to try to understand the marketplace, right? Um, I do it through my board work, through my international work, through obviously reading and engaging like many of you all. And we know that as the, the, the economy moves from a sort of um, manufacturing base to, to knowledge based, to digital based, to entrepreneurial, like we cover, we cover all, that, all the areas. One area that I'd like for us to cover more is frankly the sort of entrepreneurial space, right? Um, now we have we have a world class uh, entrepreneurship university, and no one wants to be them at all. But I think that we have uh, an important opportunity to expose our students to an entrepreneurial ecosystem that exposes them to the dynamism and the creativity um, of enterprise creation, of um, creating solutions to market needs so that they'll be better financial analysts, better marketers, better accountants. And if they so desire to start their own enterprise, which many of our students do, they will have a platform here uh, in which to, to begin to do that. I think that builds all kinds of opportunities um, for engagement, uh, for um, uh, resources. Um, and it's, it's one next stage that I'd like to see here. And so we're having conversations with many of our entrepreneurial alumni who are sort of wondering, you know, why that hasn't happened yet. But I think that's going to be a great thing for our students. Um, and one other thing, back to the other end of the spectrum. So, as many of you know, the um, accounting industry is fundamentally changing, right? And, and we are really good in accounting and part of our history, again, the sort of fidelity to our history is accounting. Our job is to continue to be, to ensure our primacy in accounting, but the accounting industry is changing. There's, there's machine learning, there's AI, we just don't see the interest in, in our students, but we are we are at the tip of the spear with. Uh, am I doing things? Or that? We're at the tip of the spear with many of our, um, particularly with KPMG, in working with them and our faculty to define the next evolution of accounting education. Um, and so that's a way of staying to staying true to our roots, our core areas are accounting, finance, and economics, and that's great. But new and adjacent space is entrepreneurship and data and some other things. And that is, that is those are the kinds of things that we're trying to think about as, a, as an academic community. Great. 
I'm going to take the next question because it's pretty specific, um, and then I'll give you a chance for the last word uh, before we wrap up. So the question is, uh, you know, are students assigned an academic advisor for all four years? Uh, and the answer is no. Um, there is first in their first year, there's a first year seminar course taught by a faculty, and that person can be an advisor, a mentor, someone to help guide a student along. That's the purpose of that, uh, that connection so that students have a relationship with a faculty member, but there's a centralized advising office called uh, Academic Services where they can meet with both student and staff uh, advisors to get into the nuts and bolts of the curriculum prerequisites, all of those pieces there. Um, as they get into their junior and senior year, they can um, seek out and should be seeking out you know, um, uh, professors who can be mentors and advisors mm -hmm. about internships, careers uh, in their specific major or discipline. So, uh, but there's plenty of support for students through academic services uh, and that centralized advising system. So Dr. Craig, you have the last word. So uh, any last thoughts to the parents, the alumni and the students in the room? No, well, let me just thank you for being here and coming out and supporting um, your students and coming out and being a part of, of my first alumni weekend. Um, I look forward to getting to know as many of you as possible and seeing you throughout the day, looking forward to the football game and I and, um, know there are all kinds of events in between then. Um, let me say finally, as I mentioned, I know how bright your kids are. I know the kind of options that they had and, and as parents, that's all we can do is to ensure that our students have options. We are absolutely delighted that you chose Bentley University um, to store them on this journey. It is a great privilege to all of us. Uh, and I wanna thank you for that. If there's anything that I get, again, I don't have deep insights. I've got a hard specific question, he's the guy. Um, but if there's anything that I can do to, um, um, to address anything on your mind, I, I, I mean that don't hesitate to call call me, reach out, email, whatever. Um, but I look forward to seeing you today. Enjoy the, enjoy the weekend. Uh, thanks for being here uh, and look forward to, to connecting with you later. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.